Welcome to First Sin Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky, the older Gansky of the group, and I'm coming to you from Central California where we're building our ark and calling animals in two by two. Really? I'm supposed to go after that? <laughs> I'm Molly. I am the producer of the podcast. I am author of the Unemployment Cookbook, the current work in progress, NOLA, and Social Media Ninja. And with us today we have Heather Luby, former host, uh, former editor of the Citron Review, full-time mom and writer and uh, professor and uh, a lot of stuff. you got a lot of irons in the fire. So Heather... Um, Super excited to have you back on the show. It always lends a little bit of credibility to have somebody intelligent on the show, um, other than, you know, Pops and Molly. So uh, what have you been up to lately? You know, not much. I am still ghostwriting a thriller novel, still working on my own novel in progress. I have a new piece of short fiction that's going to come out later this month in Manslaughter Review. And, uh, you know, living the life. Living the life. I try not to do that. It gets too real too fast sometimes. So you know. <laughs> well, uh, we'd like to continue with our normal, our new tradition here of ask the author. I did forget to uh, tweet this out. I should have let uh, Jeremiah Peters know that we were doing his question tonight. I'm sure he would have tuned in if he was able. But he's a Patriots fan, so it's probably better that he's not listening. Um, Definitely. <clears throat> I don't like the Patriots. I apologize to all you Patriot fans. I know I'm, I'm a Dolphin fan. Your team is better than mine. I'm simply jealous and I'm petty. Yes, that's true. Um, I'm a Broncos fan, and your team is not better than mine. Oh, <laughs> mic drop. Okay. <laughs> all right. So Jeremiah Peters, good friend of mine, uh, asks, good writer also, uh, asks, what uh, famous classic would you rewrite or would you rewrite a famous classic? If so, which one? And what changes would you make to it? And so, uh, really intriguing question. Uh, really kind of, I uh, hadn't, I don't think I've ever been asked this before. So, Jeremiah, thanks. Um, I'll try and uh, tweet you and let you know that we covered this question. But uh, for me, um, I, I don't know. I, my first thought would be the Star Wars prequels, but I don't know if they count as classics. Um, but I would definitely change... All of it, um, except for three. Three was pretty good. But, uh, if we're looking about like, talking about literary uh, classics, I don't know. Um, I, I think of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, so this kind of thing has been done before. Uh, but I tend to gravitate, since I've been writing more fantasy lately, I'd probably gravitate more toward a King Arthur kind of a story, something that's very um, archaic. And I would want to kind of modernize it a little bit. I wouldn't necessarily change many of the plot points, but probably deepen the characters a little bit, go a little bit more into their backstories, um, try and play up a little bit more of the emotional context rather than just kind of telling the story, you know, try and show the story. Um, that's the first thing that I would see um, and think of, and I know that's not very original. Several other people have already done things like that, um, but I couldn't think of a better answer, and so I feel like a bad writer. So I'm going to send it over to a good writer. Pops, what about you? Yeah, I had to chew on this one for a while. Um, usually classics don't need rewriting because, well, they're classics, and uh, they don't good need point. to be later. <laughs> but uh, assuming the question is a must uh, and must have an answer to that, uh, for some reason I uh, my mind ran to Edgar Allan Poe's short story, uh, manuscript found in a bottle. Uh, the title is MS period found in a bottle, but of course it refers to a manuscript uh, written in 1833. And some post scholars think that's the thing that put him on the fast track to fame and the like. Others think it's the first science fiction story ever. Uh, hmm. I don't know if I'd call it that or not, uh, but some would, uh, some have said that. Uh, it's an unusual story about uh, a guy who's on a ship, and I love Edgar Allan Poe because he's using the old language when he does his ship stories. Uh, my favorite line was, uh, we were safe and we had the wind in our poop. And um, <laughs> it's just not a phrase you hear anymore. Uh, anymore. No, not too often. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he's referring to the poop deck and the, the superstructure at the stern of a, 
an old sailing ship, and it was called the poop or the poop deck. Um, but nonetheless, it's still fun to say. Uh, so anyway, it's about uh, a ship that gets caught in this uh, horrible storm, and this guy writes a note, and he puts it in a bottle and throws it out, and they encounter another weird ship with uh, people. He's able to jump on the other ship because they spin over each other, but no one on the crew can see him. So what I'd rewrite on it, though, was the ending, because the ending's really iffy. It mm -hmm. doesn't have a satisfying resolution where just he just ends the story. And that's it. And then the only other thing I would do with that story is use 21st century language. Not that he was wrong in what he used, of course, um, but it's just a little difficult to get through. It's a, it's a little more waiting than reading. So Edgar Allan Poe's manuscript found in a bottle. Yeah, I, I guess that brings up the pit and the pendulum as well. That would be that's another one that might be able to use a little work on the ending. But I I do love Poe. This might be a first in fiction. First, I don't know that we've ever used the word poop. Uh, on the show and definitely have not used it as many times as we currently have so um, increasing the, the higher standard of broadcasting here <laughs> keeping it classy yeah well we want to we want to give the listeners the you know the straight poop so yeah of course I'm using a nautical term I don't know what you're talking about uh, neither do I. Um, I I don't know boats so let's uh, Molly why don't you save us real quick what about you I, uh, this is going to be a really bad evening for me if I have to keep following stuff like that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it's a classic by other people's standards, but I am, have always been in love with Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I grew up on that book, reading and rereading it. Um, Joe March is the strong female heroine. She's also a tomboy, my middle name being Joe. There's always been that connection there, and she's a writer. I would love to rewrite that in a more contemporary, modern setting strictly from the aspect of the relational dynamics, relationship dynamics, what they had back then, which was prim and proper for the women, is not so much, they're much more freer now, but they're still the relationship issues. And I would like to rewrite that that way and conquer, you know, women conquer all. Throw in, uh, throw in some vampires. They'll have a bestseller. Little vampires. Great. There you go. I claim it. That's my idea. Little, <laughs> little women vampires. <laughs> I'm doing it. Your oh take, goodness. your fault. <laughs> How about you, Heather? You know, I would have to say Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. It's mm. easily one of my favorite books of all time. In fact, I have a first edition sitting on a bookshelf right behind me that was a gift from a few years ago. Mm. Um, I just, I don't know so much about what I would change, just that I wish that I had been the author of it. <laughs> It's just, it's a classic gothic novel that's great atmosphere and suspense. It's a lot of menace. And I love that word, menace. <laughs> great first line. The setting is gorgeous. Um, if I were to change anything about it, I might give the nameless young narrator a name because that always sort of kind of bothered me. <laughs> um, and if I didn't change that, then I would say maybe I would write in a few more maybe love scenes. I'm not usually into romance, but there was just something about that novel I kind of always wanted to know, um, you know, what her and Maxim were sort of like behind closed doors, you know, what was it like when they were intimate together. I wanted to see a little bit more of that passion, you know, intermingled with the sort of more horror suspense aspect. I actually saw the 1940 uh, Laurence Olivier Joan Fontaine movie directed by Alfred Hitchcock last week. Mm. For the very first time, I had never seen it, and I got it from the library and made my husband watch it with me. <laughs> was it amazing? It was amazing. It was terrific. You talk about that word menace, and this is where I get a little bit nerdy, but um, that's a term uh, that I first heard with Raymond Carver in terms of literature, in the, in the, mm -hmm. the term menace. And so my, my fantasy football teams are always named Carver's Menace. Um, and then... <laughs> I, nobody is menaced okay. by my fantasy football teams, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, I normally change it to uh, rabbit chihuahuas about halfway through the year. Um, my slogan <laughs> is scary but harmless. So, oh, good times. Well, we are still in the, the month of ideas, and now what we're talking about is getting started, going from idea to draft. And I say that intentionally not idea to manuscript, not idea to, uh, you know, publication, idea to draft. And, and you have to understand that um, whatever you come up with first is simply 
a draft. Uh, and it's a big step to take. And it can be very intimidating, especially if you've spent a lot of time brainstorming, uh, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, outlining, um, like we talked about last week. These types of things, if you've been, spent any amount of time on them, it can be a little intimidating to actually start putting words on page. Others of us, like me, uh, immediately start putting words on page as quickly as, as possible. So it's not as intimidating. I get intimidated about halfway through when I don't know where I'm going next. Uh, but we are now ready. We've selected a, a idea. We're ready to go. We're ready to roll up our sleeves and get going. So what we're going to talk about is, is how to do that. And, and the first thing that we want to mention is that there is no correct way of doing this. These are our suggestions, things that we do as writers, things that have uh, gotten us through uh, drafts of our stories. Um, but your path is really going to be your own. Um, find what works best for you. Uh, whatever that looks like for you, I would suggest that the very first thing that you do is to make a schedule. And it's, it's often you hear people saying, I would love to write, but I don't have the time. That's fantastic. Neither do I. Uh, neither does Pops or Heather or Molly. None of us have time to to write. We just don't. Our days are, are super full with everything else. Um, you have to make a schedule. You've got to find some time. You have to make it. You have to make that time. And so that might be waking up early, an hour early to do some writing. It might be going to bed an hour later and doing some writing. Uh, but at some point, you need to prioritize an hour or two within your day where you're going to put words on page. If you don't do that, I fear that you will never complete your draft. And that's really the first thing that we want you to do. You've had your idea. You've got to complete that draft now. So uh, the first thing that I would suggest is making the tr making a schedule and sticking to it. Heather, how about you? Well, when you were talking about this, it reminded me of a really great quote. Um, I actually have it on a t-shirt, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but it's a quote by Richard Bausch, and it's um, I believe it first appeared in Letter to a Young Writer, which is easy to find online. But the quote is simply, writing is not an indulgence. The indulgences are what you give up in order to write. And to me, that's a really profoundly important quote because I think so many times in any given day, like you said, none of us have time. And I'll be thinking about all the things that I really need to get done in any given day. And there are several things that are important to me in my life, my family, my friends, my community, my church, um, in addition to writing. But it's really easy to let the writing slide when you start thinking out about it in terms of an indulgence, in terms of a hobby, in terms of, well, something when I have time, I'll get to. You really have to treat it like it's part um, of your job. Even if you have another job, even if you have another career, this is your second job. And you have to show up and you have to put your butt in the chair. Even on days where you don't feel like it or you don't like it, you have to report no different than you know if you were doing it to feed your family. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with that. You also mentioned creating your own boss. And what yeah. do you mean by that? Well, it's sort of a funny story. I remember uh, when I was at Antioch and I was working with Leonard Chang. He was telling a story about when I think he, maybe he was in grad school or it was soon after. and uh, But he was younger and he would have friends come to him all the time and be like, hey, let's go out, let's get drinks, let's go to dinner, let's hang out. And he would always tell them, like, well, I need to be writing or I'm, I'm trying to work on my novel. And what happened oftentimes is that they would give him a hard time. So he decided to essentially make up a boss and gave him a name and just said, like, oh, my boss so-and-so, you know. He's so hard on me, and if I don't meet this deadline, and suddenly his friends sort of got off his back, and he said that even as he grew up and his career took off, he sort of kept this imaginary boss as a way to like motivate himself. Mm. And believe it or not, I sort of t took on the same <clears throat> mindset, except my imaginary boss is, in fact, Leonard Chang, <laughs> who is always <laughs> the voice in my head telling me um, that whatever I'm doing, I need to stop and I need to go sit down and I need to get to work. <laughs> and because I'm so afraid of disappointing him, I do it. <laughs> hey, so you get royalties for living in your head? <laughs> <laughs> you would think, right? Are you, are you charging him rent? 
You should be paying rent. <laughs> but it is absolutely the truth. He still absolutely lives in my head because he was probably the most demanding uh, mentor in, in all of my educational career, not just grad school, that I ever had. But I produced the best and the most work uh, when I was working under uh, his you know, guidance. Yeah, you bring up a a good point, and I want to I want to highlight it again for everyone uh, by saying it this way: there are a lot of people who do not understand what writers are doing, and they don't understand that it's work. I've heard many stories where people say, "Sure, my husband would be glad to help you move. He's not doing anything today but writing." And um, you know, because non-writers don't understand that there is uh, some toil involved. There's you know brain cramps. There's uh, all kinds of uh, work that goes into it, a lot of juggling that goes on, and it is a tremendous amount of work. I'm probably more weary at the end of the day of writing than I was when I was working in architecture or anything else that I did. So, yeah, you have to make sure that you schedule it. And I like what you say about that. That's great that you schedule it. Uh, and I've known people put it on the calendar. This is the time that I write, and if somebody calls, you want to do this? No, I already have an appointment. They don't uh -huh. bother telling me the appointments with themselves or their characters, but... I, I got a quick Leonard Cheng story um, to kind of further I I illuminate his character. Great, great guy. Um, one of the most popular people at Antioch as a mentor. Um, I, I had him at, for, for a workshop. I did not have him as a mentor. And I think it's because I had him for a workshop that I did not have him for a mentor. I turned in the story, got rave reviews from pretty much everyone in the workshop. He spoke very highly of it during the workshop. And then I read his comments. And oh, oh man! There was a it was a whole kind of a whole new definition of mean. Like it was just it was painful, and and I remember just entire pages being scratched out with the word weak, weak. And I saw that all, and I was oh, man like this. And then the 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 kicker is that he was right a hundred percent. I was a hundred percent right on everything. So the story is better for his touch on it. Um, I like that idea. Create your own boss. Um, do you did you mention that to him? Have you Facebooked him or something? You should, oh, you should he, do that. He absolutely knows. We definitely uh, keep in touch for sure and and check in about what I'm doing and, and what I'm writing and so forth. But he absolutely knows that he's the voice in my head. Because <laughs> when I worked with him my last semester, essentially I came to him with no more than about forty or fifty pages of a of a manuscript. And uh, this was about July, and I was set to graduate in December, and he said, I expect you to finish it. And I said, well, I think it's going to be like three, 350 pages. And he was like, yeah, finish it. And I was like, well, you know I'm preparing for my graduate lecture, and I've got two kids, and I've just moved across the country. And, and he was like, yeah, yeah, I know all that, um, but I need you to finish it by October. <laughs> That's awesome. And I did. Way to go, Heather. It's because I was so afraid of disappointing him. So the key is, is whatever boss you create in your head, make it someone that you were terrified of disappointing. <laughs> right. I hear Rob's voice, Rob Robert's voice in my head, which is funny. When I'm going through my own work, I could hear him saying, you know, just trust the reader. You've already said this. Stop saying this. Um, so it's funny how that works. Um, Pops, you've got a couple, a couple points here uh, about deciding how your brain is wired. Sure. Uh, but before I do that, um, Tess Root said her boss would be Bradbury, Ray Bradbury. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming there, but uh, I also wanted to say happy anniversary. This is their, she and her husband's 31st, I think is what she said. Yes. Yeah. 31st anniversary, the Baskin Robbins anniversary, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, something like that. That's right. Um, I think one of the things I see most with new writers is they don't know how they think, they don't know how they work. Um, and some of this has to be by discovery, so because they're new, they haven't had a chance to figure that out yet. But as you're getting ready now, you've got your story picked, you've got the basic idea, uh, and you're starting to put words on a page. You want to get to that uh, first draft with that. You need to understand how it is you work. We do not work the same. No two writers work the same. Uh, and so you might be uh, an outliner and love it. You might hate outlining but still be an outliner and need to do it that way. Or you might be an intuitive uh, and love doing that. Or you might want to be an intuitive, but you're really not, and you think it might make things easier, and it won't. Um, you have to figure it out. Do you like to write? Or do you write better in the morning? Do 
you write better in the evening. You have to do it in small increments. Um, do you need to do a blast copy where you just race through to the end, then go back and rewrite the thing with more thought? Um, are you one of those Dean Koontz people who have trouble going to page two until you think page one is perfect? Whatever it is, figure it out uh, because that's what you're going to have to factor in as you begin to do this. So decide how your brain is wired. Figure it out. Uh, if you're not sure on anything, like the whether you should outline or be an intuitive writer, when in doubt, outline. Uh, you'll know quick enough. <laughs> uh, but when in doubt, you got to make a choice one way or the other. You will have, you stand a better chance of getting done with the book if you outline. If you're certain you're an intuitive, then that's fine. Um, run with that. And remember, most of my books I've done without outlining. Not all of them. Um, I, I do outline when I need to. So decide how your brain is wired. Absolutely. You, uh, you also mentioned here uh, the, your technique for priming the pump. Mm -hmm. What I used to do when I was first starting out, uh, getting ready to write a book. I probably did this for my first 10 books. Uh, the first thing I would do is I would get as many books as I could off my shelf that uh, were pretty close to the same genre. So if I'm writing a thriller or supernatural suspense or whatever it might be, I try to get at least a half dozen of those. And I would sit on the floor. Obviously, I was younger. And I'd sit on the floor, and I would open these books, and I would go through a sequence of seeing how the book was constructed. And I started asking a bunch of questions. And I would keep track of them. A few times, I even did a spreadsheet on them. How many chapters? Is it first person or third person? Is there more dialogue than narration? Or is it narration heavy? Uh, what does the first page look like? What is the first line? Uh, how strong is all of that? Uh, and I would go through them, and what it does is it gets you into that writing mood. And uh, I would I'd figure out how many pages in every chapter, how many chapters in the book. Are they using cinematic style where chapters are real short? Are they using uh, the older style where chapters can be very long? What did they do? And that would give me an idea of what perhaps I should do. Uh, and then I would select one of them and uh, then run with that. And that always helped me out. And another way to prime the pump, uh, and this isn't in the notes, Aaron, but uh, another way to uh, prime the pump uh, is to take a book that's in the same genre as yours uh, and open to the first couple of pages and copy them, type them in. You're not going to steal them. All you're doing is getting rhythm. All you're getting is how the words are put together and how to get started and do a couple pages of that, and then most likely you can delete it all and get started because now you're warmed up. I actually just recently did something very similar, even in an editing job, for the, thrill for the thriller novel that I'm sort of editing, kind of co-authoring. Um, I went through a Vince Flynn book, actually. See, it's still on my desk. <laughs> and I basically kind of dissected the book. Like Al was saying, I, I looked at how many pages was each chapter, how many times, uh, how many uh, point of view characters did they use, and how often did it switch among those characters. I kind of graphed out um, when the plot points came in, uh, what was the structure, and I sort of I broke it all down. And it was through the through disassembling a successful thriller novel by a popular author that I was able to sort of grasp the expectations for what I needed the book I was working on to do. So it was a lot of work, but at the same time, I felt like I learned a whole lot by reading that book and dissecting it at the same time. Absolutely. I, I actually have my students um, copy the first line of some um, published novels. Uh, right now we're talking about first lines, and I have them do that. Again, they're not publishing these stories. Uh, if they were, then it would definitely be plagiarism. You don't want to do that. But um, just to just to get a sense of, of different voices that authors establish early on and how those can progress and to give them a chance to kind of stretch their um, fiction wings, if you will. Uh, so I do encourage that. Read widely in your genre. Um, break those books down. Find out what they have for you. Um, see how your book fits the same structure. If it does, what changes you're going to make, if you're going to make any changes. But keeping those things in mind. Uh, and, and speaking of first lines, I am a huge advocate of having the greatest first line that you can possibly come up with. Do not let that stop you from writing. Um, 
whatever first line you come up with for your first draft is fine. I don't care if it's it was a dark and stormy night or it was a bright and sunny day. Nobody cares about the first line of your first draft. They do care about the first line of your final draft, but you've got time. Mm-hmm. So don't get caught up in that right now. However, that being said, I'm also an advocate of writing several different first lines to see which one sounds the best for you. So I'll spend some time doing that before I undertake a novel. I'll, I'll write the first line and I'll end up rewriting that one, you know, seven, eight, nine times, whatever it is, but it's just one sentence. And once I find something that feels right, then I move with it and then I don't think about it again until I'm done with the draft. That's when I go back and double check. So um, first line is important, but don't let it keep you from actually starting your project. Along those same lines, you don't want to get too caught up in editing. The The biggest killer of, of first drafts is editing as you go. And I know that there are some pops. You've mentioned Dean Koontz who gets the first what first page right before he can write page two and then page two right before he can write page three. I don't know how he ever finishes a novel. I can't work that way. Most people I know cannot work that way. Most writers that I know or those who want to be writers um, have never finished a first draft because they're constantly in the revision mode um, and they've not they've not uh, just powered through and that's super super important. Um, we talk a lot at Antioch and, and in the business in any creative writing class you're gonna hear, hear the term um, poopy first drafts. See there's that word again um, and that's fine. Is, that's, that, is that the term they used at Antioch? Um, <laughs> Maybe not. No, at Antioch yeah, they. I think they said crappy. It was a little yeah. more cutting edge at, at Antioch. Oh, no, that wasn't it. I'm the shock of it all. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to keep our clean rating here, but it actually comes from Annie Lamott's book, uh, Bird by Bird, and she uses a different word in that as well, and that's where the term comes from. So, um, yeah, your first draft is probably going to suck, and that's fine because your second draft is going to be great. So don't fall into the trap of editing as you go. I really think that you need to just get the story down um, and and really the way I look at it is um, if you if you're paving a road if you're building a road you're gonna pave it and you're paving as you build this road by the time you get to the end you're gonna realize you ended up in the wrong destination uh, you're in the wrong city you took a wrong turn somewhere because you're too busy looking behind you than looking in front of you um, instead you know you want to grate the road and make it smooth and get to the proper destination then you can go back and put the pavement on and make everything smooth um, right now you just need to to place the trail and get to the end and then once you're at the end then you'll know what it is that you actually want to say that you've been trying to say and that's where you're gonna be able to go back and revise with more efficiency um, otherwise it's just a never-ending process Exactly. The key is to get the story down, and that's why we have first drafts. It's the same reason musicians practice. It's why they rewrite lyrics. It's uh, the same reason uh, poets rework things. Uh, it's the same reason the baseball stars, home run hitters, stay at the plate and they keep hacking away until they get everything um, just where it's supposed to be so they can be at their best. And same thing with writing. Get the first story down. Now you can go back and do some real art and start making it that much better. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so often we think that we know what we're writing about when we set out to write that story or that novel. But at least it's been true for me and and many other writers that I know that so often we don't really discover what our story is about until you're finished with that first draft. That's for the first time that you're really able to, to grasp, you know, thematically what it is that you're trying to write about as a whole. And that's why I think it does no good to edit while you write because so many times you're going to find that at some point in that draft, that story might need to take a different direction. And then all that time that you've been wasting doing those, those edits as you go, they're going to be for nothing because maybe your story has taken a completely different turn. So I, I do think it's only once you've completed that draft that you can really grasp what it is that you've written and where you truly want to take it. And that that work is done in revision. I agree. I agree. Um, 
Molly, you you uh oh you're on mute. You're probably in the chat room, aren't you? You're going to mention not... something about this okay. here. Just that I'm completely the opposite, and I really like to edit as I go along. Oh, I and shouldn't have let you say anything. I here, think, let me mute real fast. I think... <laughs> but you and I have had discussions over this for over a year, and I hate to admit this, but my book that you've been mentoring me on is still not finished because I still edit what I have instead of moving forward. So um, I'm going to recant almost everything I said previously and say, yes, just write the um, cruddy first draft and get it out of your system and then go back and edit it. My, my favorite is when I get a text from you that says, working on chapter 19 now, and I get an email tomorrow morning that says, here's chapter 6, I made some revisions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad with numbers. But, well, that's uh, not a public humiliation in any manner whatsoever. <laughs> Thanks for live on air with you know, that one, Aaron. Um, and, and I uh, am working yeah. on chapter 19 tonight, and you will have it tomorrow, but I was really excited about chapter six, so I just I'm wanted glad. to share that. I'm glad that you did. No, I and 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 you <laughs> are not true. alone, you, Molly. You are that. not alone. Um, that's I would say that's the vast majority of the students that I've worked with. They want to edit. They oh well, I'm going to go a different direction now, so I'm going to go back and fix what I have. Mm, I I okay, but. Don't expect to finish the book. You know, it's it's at some point. It, I find that the vast majority of people have to finish before they can go back and revise. Otherwise, they don't finish. If it, it's usually an either or, um, with with the few exceptions, Dean Koontz perhaps being the exception that proves the rule. But um, don't get too caught up in in editing as you go. I think we've made that point. So. So you're, you're saying that I really should do chapter 19 tonight and send that to you and not give you chapter 7 tomorrow. I. I would be excited if I saw chapter 19. Oh, All right. I'll say it that way. Here we are, live on air. I am committing to chapter 19. All right. Well, the good news, Molly, is now that you've recanted everything, I'm going to I'm going to call an end to the public stoning we had planned. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> darn. Hey, hey, Heather, you're on my side, okay? <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Boys right. versus girls. There you yeah. go. Um, that's just not fair. We have no chance. <laughs> so, well, the other things uh, that you want to do in your your first draft is you want to establish your primary characters uh, in the first pages. At least your your main character, your protagonist, should be obviously on page one um, and continue it. Now, I'm not talking about their physical appearance. I don't care what color their hair is or you know what color their eyes are. They don't really have control over that. Um, I mean, yeah, they can dye their hair, they can wear contacts, but for the most part, that doesn't really tell us much about them. Um, unless you've got some sort of strange abnormality, they've got three eyeballs or four arms or a massive scar across their face. Um, Wait, I saw that in a movie once. Oh. Yeah, I, the one with the guy with three eyes and four arms and the massive scar is one of each. Too much, yeah. Um, if if it's something. Ter terribly out of the ordinary that ne needs to be explained right up front, then go ahead. Gregory Samsa awoke one morning to find that he had been transformed into a giant cockroach. Okay. Um, you can give me a little bit relevant. of physical description there. That's relevant. <laughs> yeah. Um, it didn't say Gregory Samsa awoke one morning to find that he had blonde hair, that his blonde hair was disheveled. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, he woke up, so hair's disheveled. Get it. Move right on. now I've got this image of a cockroach with blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I was going for. Oh, uh, right. The cockroaches in my house all have tattoos. They smoke cigars. It's, uh, <laughs> it's terrible. They grease their hair back. Anyhow, moving on. Um, you need to get Jean Grey to take care of that. Yeah, I do. So <laughs> instead of the physical features, you want to focus on who they are, their psychology, their relationships, um, what they love, what is their motivation, um, what gets them out of bed in the morning, uh, what do they look forward to each morning, afternoon, evening, uh, what do they do when they're off work, how do they spend their time, those types of things, um, which are going to really help us to get to know this person, that's infinitely more important than just their physical characteristics. And I think a lot of times the temptation as writers, especially new writers, is to write the physical description up front because I don't know, maybe you want to map it out so you have something to refer back to later. Um, but 
it really what it boils down to is it's just not super interesting. So you want to kind of move away from that and, and get into what I consider the good stuff, the psychology of the characters. Yeah, I think ultimately just be prepared to write scenes and chapters that flesh out who your characters are so that you can really get to know them as a writer. Uh, fully understanding, though, that a good portion of the necessary character exploration might not make it into that final draft. You know, kind of going back to what you said earlier in terms of not revising and editing, I always tell um, new writers in class just to get it all out. You know, if you need to write a couple of scenes or chapters that, you know, about something that happened to them when they were in childhood or a scene where they're interacting with their mom and dad or an ex-girlfriend, like write them out because it helps you grasp who your characters are. Um, but fully understanding that that's for your benefit and the work that you're doing as a writer in terms of knowing who you're writing about. That's not stuff that will be in those final drafts after revisions, but don't be afraid to write them. They're not wasted at all, um, for sure. And, and a lot of times that's just getting to know your characters. Um, that's for, like you say, for you to know your characters mm -hmm. to better inform you. Pops, you, you mentioned in the show notes that a lot of intuitive writers, myself included, discover their characters as a story develops. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I don't want to say I'm famous for this, but uh, I will typically figure out who one of my characters is uh, like in the final chapter. I'll be in the last chapter, I'll be like, oh, now I get this guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'll finish the, the the draft to know I've got a lot of revision ahead of me, and that's because I'm a discovery writer, an, an intuitive writer. It, that's fine. Um, I've done that several times in, in several books where I get to the end and I go, oh, this makes a lot more sense now. I should probably make this apparent at the beginning. Well, and kind of like I said earlier, it's like even if you thought you knew who your character was in the beginning, and even if you set out to write them in one certain way, if you do tend to be a bit more of an intuitive writer, there's a good chance that when you get to the end, the grasp you're going to have of your character after spending 300 pages with them is going to be so much more in-depth than the grasp that you had of them when they were nothing but just like a figment in your head. After Absolutely. you've spent 300 pages and countless hours um, sort of embodying that character, you, you can't help but know them better than you ever knew them before you started. Mm -hmm. And I would even add, just very quickly, that you need to allow room for your characters to surprise you as a writer. Um, and I, I think when we believe that we know our characters completely, then we have our characters falling into stereotypes and cliches and doing what's expected all the time. Um, and being less people and more um, cutouts. And so I, I would say I encourage my readers, or I'm sorry, my students, to leave room to surprise themselves and to find out something new about their characters as they go on. Have your character do something that you don't expect them to do. You can figure it out later why they did that. Make it relevant, make it important, but just allow them to surprise you. That's one thing that I would suggest. Yeah, absolutely. Even outliners need to be open to change. Yeah. The outline is just a basic idea. But sometimes, like, if you're going to travel from east coast to west coast and you're on the uh, the interstate, every once in a while you might want to get off. There's something that's going to interest you. And for some reason you feel like you need to get off the interstate for a bit. That happens in outline. you got the basic thing figured out. Um, but then you think, well, something over here is calling my name, and you mosey over there, and then you find out why. Because the subconscious is always working in an artist and especially in a writer. Um, there's things going on in the back of our heads that we don't always recognize until later. Indeed. Yeah, I like I like that. We need to take the scenic route sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't always be in such a rush. Um, that being said, let's talk about conflict. You should be in a rush. Um, get the conflict started early, early in the pages. Um, you're establishing your characters, you're establishing the conflict. Uh, we use the term in media res, it means begin in the middle. We use the old adage, um, in late, out early. Uh, we Did I get that right? No, late in, early out. out. Late yeah. in, early out. Um, and, and Kurt Vonnegut's one of his eight rules for writing fiction is begin as close to the end as possible. 
Mm. Um, and and I, I do believe that. It, you have to have some conflict early in the pages. That's what contemporary readers expect. Um, in, in some other genres, you might be able to have kind of a longer, kind of sprawling opening. That was okay, you know, in, in the previous centuries. Uh, but contemporary readers now really want conflict right away. They, they, they've got short attention spans, um, or I take that back. Their attention spans are fine. They're just more interested in conflict than they are with the wanderings of the mind, um, specifically in commercial fiction. They really want things to kind of get going. Um, Pops, you, you have an idea to help out with that. I do. Oh, the yeah. three-act structure? <laughs> I was, I was, I was, to, I was, I'm sorry, digesting what you said there. Yeah. Um, I I always suggest to new writers and experienced writers use a three act structure. You can't go wrong with it. Um, now there may be a storyline that this has happened to me. I've done it two acts and four acts. So you know it's it's not writ with the hand of God on stone. But if if you're new to writing, use a three act structure. You just can't go wrong. And we talked about three act structure, but First 25% is Act 1, second 50% of the book is Act 2, last 25% is Act 3, roughly. Don't do math on it. Just know that it's going to break down that way. Um, and uh, you, you can't go wrong with it. Most drama is done in three acts, uh, going all the way back to the Greeks. It's a natural human thing. Um, so if you're not quite sure how to set up your story, consider the three-act uh, structure. And that'll help uh, help get you started and keep you on track till you get to the end. A couple uh, other things you want to keep in mind. I think this is a really important one. You want to show the seed of the idea that you fell in love with. Whatever idea it was that came to you, that interested you, that you are now writing about, get that same image to your reader quickly, as quickly as possible. I mean, if it's the you know, obviously, if it's the end, you want it at the end. But, um, Pops, you gave the the example of the paper hitting your window as you're driving and your thought of, of what if my name was on that? Is that mm -hmm. what you had said? Or, or what if my son's name was on that? Oh, or one of my son's name was on it, yeah. Yeah, and so that's an interesting idea. That's a great little image, right? Uh, man driving on windy day, here comes a paper, mystery, and now it's gone. What do you do? Um, let's get that in there. Let's get that there. That's a good place to begin. That sort of interesting beginning is going to keep your readers um, sticking around uh, to read the rest of it. So if it was interesting enough to you as a writer to write a book about it, it's going to be interesting enough to a reader to read a book about it. So don't keep that until the middle. You want it up front. Um, again, unless, of course, it's the final scene that you've seen, this epic battle or whatever that you've seen, then you want to save it for the appropriate time. But for the most part, whatever that story seed idea was that you had, let's see it early. Uh, little little vampires, right? Um, how does little women begin? What does it look like diff You know, if there are vampires instead of people? Um, run with that. That's an interesting idea. Go with it. Um, I, I'm an advocate of collecting artwork and making soundtracks for your work in progress. Um, I, I have finished several books because of the soundtracks that I've created. Um, they've really helped me through some writer's block. Uh, whenever I get stuck on the Hand of Adonai series, I'm consuming fantasy images, um, you know, some great CGI artwork, uh, that kind of stuff that just inspires me enough. It kind of replenishes, fills up the tank, as it were, renews the... Um, the desire to write because sometimes work is tough and it's work and it's tiring and you want to give up but going back to that idea that you first fell in love with seeing those pictures um, to inspire that part of your brain um, listening to the music that inspires you to write all of those things constantly keep that influx of art going so that you can continue to make your art yeah, and don't underestimate the value. I know you mentioned it earlier about reading to inform your fiction. When you're kind of talking about you know artwork and soundtracks, it also makes me think that I know we've touched on, let's say, if I'm writing a thriller, reading a thriller novel. But even going outside of that scope, um, I know that for me, 
when um, I was writing Laws of Motion because I had to really immerse myself in a grief story, I was mm -hmm. reading a lot of nonfiction about how people handle grief. Grief. I have um, advocacy groups or um, support groups for people who have uh, lost someone in a violent homicide. I read poetry along those lines. I read plays. So it wasn't just about reading within the genre. It was about reading anything from nonfiction to poetry to screenplays to watching movies. Anything that I felt like either thematically, atmospherically, um, the study of point of view, like in any way that I might be able to connect these other sources to what I was writing in a way that would inform what I was writing was really beneficial. And while I always love artwork and music, like I said, poetry, movies, you can kind of find those inspirations everywhere. It doesn't always have to just be in other fiction. Agreed. Yeah. Um, very well said, and, and I think that's really important to not only reading in your genre, but reading to inform your genre as well. Um, I also like to say that you don't know it all, even when you think you do. What? It's that's a lie. That. What? No, You're no. Wrong. Huh? Object, oh. object. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You shouldn't say anything in the show notes. I, I vote you off the podcast. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, we'll see you next week, guys. Sorry, I've I, I got to go. Um, Again, this kind of goes back to what we were saying about the characters. You don't know your characters as well as you think you do. Be Allow them the opportunity to surprise you. Allow your story to take a different direction. If that's where the story seems to be going, um, be you know be open to that. We talked about that, Pops. You said even outliners need to be open to change um, because things change. I mean, when was the last time... I'm trying to think of some a good example here, and I'm coming up blank, but... Um, something that you envisioned at the beginning that actually turned out the way, the exact way that you wanted it to. Sometimes, you know, if you're cooking um, and your, you know, souffle is not setting up properly, you're going to have to make some minor adjustments to make sure that it works. I just watched Kids Baking Championship before I came back here. I'm sorry. This is a terrible example. Um, but that's the way life is, right? I mean, whatever whatever plans we, we have for ourselves at any given time, they can change the next day, the next month, the next year. We're all sort of a work in progress, and I think that we ought to treat the art that we create the same way. That was so much more intelligent than what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's life. I, I couldn't think of an example. How about life? Um, it's right in front of you me. had to choose between life and souffle, and you chose souffle. <laughs> Maybe he's hungry. <laughs> At least it wasn't the poop deck. Um, <laughs> I, I came up with that example on the poop deck. So, oh, thank you, Heather, for saving me on that. Yes, life. Uh, sometimes you have to make ki minor course adjustments. So, um, yeah, we got a, a couple quick points here, pops. You've got kind of a bullet list here of uh, points. We're kind of coming up on time here. So, uh, you had a couple things to say, and then uh, Heather, I think you had one more thing to say at the end there. Mhm. Mm sure. Sure. And at the end, we we I think we need to tell people where we got the title "Kick This Pig." Oh, that would probably... We should have done that at the beginning. We'll make yeah. a course correction yeah. at the end there. So. Well, we're saving it to the end. It's the reveal. It's in the uh, Ebby Loogie, the epilogue. <laughs> uh, don't expect to do everything at one time. Uh, and that's one of the problems is we get overwhelmed with the book we're working on. Don't worry about the book. Okay? You worry about the scene you're on. You worry about the bit of dialogue you're working on. That's all you need to focus on at the time. It will all come together. So don't expect to do everything at one time or you will go stark raving mad. Or the way uh, we used to say it is you eat what's on your plate. Uh, don't worry about what's going to be for dinner tomorrow night. You've got something on your plate right now. Deal with that. And if you're Molly, you've got all kinds of things on your plate right now. And you have um, multiple plates. And you have multiple plates. So. <laughs> and if you're don't Aaron, you're trying to eat. make a souffle. Uh, <laughs> What do you bring to the kitchen, Heather? <laughs> I'm moving on here. Don't expect it to be easy. Uh, some people think uh, writing is easy. It, it's not. It's going to be hard. So what? Anything worthwhile is hard. So don't expect it to be easy. Just keep plowing forward. Uh, don't worry if you have to toss out some material because it no longer serves the story. Um, one of my favorite lines was a friend of mine. He's been on the show, Jack Cavanaugh, uh, and he, was, uh, he used to teach history and he would ask for a five-page term paper, 
and the students would moan and groan, five pages, that's be so long, and he'd say, I'm a writer, I throw that much away a day. Um, so, you know, it's if you have to throw stuff out, you have to throw stuff out, but that's that's a good thing. you got to trim the roses, so um, if write more than you need to if necessary. That was being said earlier, because you can always take that stuff out. Uh, don't be afraid to start. Don't be afraid if you get stuck. Don't be afraid of the size of the project or fear of rejection. Uh, just stop being afraid. You know what fear is? F-E-A-R. It's a false expectation about reality. Well, that'll preach. Um, anyway. I think it has several times. It has many times. Uh, in my inner dialogue with myself, the most frequent thing I say to myself as a way of encouragement are these words. Shut up, Al. Get to work. You'd be surprised how many times I say that. Start writing. Sure. And I always obey my bossy self. Uh, so there's just time to just get down and do it and stop worrying about whether or not you can finish. Finish what's right in front of you. So that's the little bullet list there right towards the end. Yeah, and I have to agree with your don't be afraid to start because I can say sometimes that is the biggest step. And just reminding new writers that when they're thinking about starting, you don't have to start at the beginning. Sometimes that pressure of knowing where to start or what should be my first line is really paralyzing. So just pick pick something and start writing. It can be any scene in your head. It can start with any character. It doesn't even have to be your point of view character or your protagonist. Just whatever way that you can find yourself to get into that story, a beginning, middle, or end, doesn't matter, jump in and do it. Um, the true beginning is going to emerge when you're in revisions anyway, so don't let that pressure keep you from taking that first step. Absolutely. Oh, uh, a lot, a lot of information tonight. Uh, a lot of notes. I'll put it up in the show notes and hopefully have that posted before Monday this time. Apologize for the delay with last week's. Um, but uh, Molly, you've been keeping an eye on the chat room. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns? No questions. Um, Al already covered what the people in our our our, our imaginary bosses who they would be for me and Tess. Um, well, I said mine would be named Fred or Vito, but I like Tessa's answer better for Bradbury. Uh, scrolling up, scrolling up. Heather did ask the question of the group nobody answered. What book has a first line that you love or story? Maybe we can get to that next week. And then Tess, as always, is handy with the information. Oh, she did answer that. She says, in a hole in a the ground there lived a hobbit. That's her favorite first line. Yeah, that's the line that started that book, that started him writing that book. That is so that fantastic. Thing, yeah. That's yeah. a great one. And Marie, I'm trying to see, oh, Marie Bass said she likes what Aaron said about getting the seat up front. That's the first time that she's heard that said, and she thought that was a great idea. Great. And that's about it. Oh. Just a general discussion. It was a lot of interaction tonight. I really obviously always enjoy that. Tess said she would, on the rewriting portion that we started with, that she would rewrite Beowulf. All power to you, Tess. Oh, I yeah. missed that. More Sorry. power to you. You're right. yourself out, huh? <laughs> so everybody's got to do it, I guess. She um, did write an, a novella based on 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 Beowulf, the the legend, and and it was a really good read. So good for her. Hey, pops, did you want to explain? Let's kick this pig before I forget to explain that. Sure. There's uh, two basic sources. We think it's, it's never been fully narrowed down. Uh, kick this pig is not an obscene <laughs> statement. Some think it comes from uh, motorcyclists riding uh, Harleys called hogs, and when you kick-started the hog, you were kicking the pig. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding, though, is it comes from submarines, and, you know, I have that big interest in submarines since I did that uh, book, and submarines used to be called pig boats. In the Navy, there are ships, and boats are carried on ships. No ships are ever carried on boats. Now, even today, with big submarines, they still call them boats. But uh, the first ones were really small, and they were called pig boats. And so to get things started, you kick this pig. And so that's what it meant. Let's get started. There you go. And we have gotten started, and we have gotten finished. I don't know if that's grammatically correct, but I said it. So uh, next week, we will have a special guest with us, uh, if all works out well, Jeff Gerke. Um, Pops, you, you know Jeff. Uh, he's written several books. Uh, he used to have his own publishing company. 
Um, I'm going to be teaming up with him at the Orange County Christian Writers Conference coming up in April. Um, and he agreed to be on our podcast. So we're going to be talking. It's our it's our wild card week. So we're going to move away from ideas. And he wants to talk about, uh, I think, showing and telling. So the title that he's come up with is I Can't Picture It. So he'll be here to talk with us about that. He, uh, he is the new writer in the Harbingers series. Frank Peretti has written his last one in the series. And Jeff Gerke is the new one. Taking, I did not know Great. that. Yeah, taking Frank's place. Wow. So. Nice. He's the, oh. Now, and introducing a new character in the process. So, did Frank um, did he like uh, fulfill his commitment, or did he just kind of get busy with other things, or it's the story? On well, his there's egg? no real commitment. the The agreement was we'll keep doing this while it's fun. Oh, okay. And, you know, so it's it's one of those things. But I think he had another uh, large book uh, contract come along, so he's going to do a full length book instead of a novella, and that's going to mm -hmm. take up a lot of his time. So his new one just came out uh, in the Harbinger series. That's the most recent release. And Angie Hunt is up next. But it, it's his last one. It has pirates in it. That answers Frank's. Gotta Better be get pirates. That no vampires? Yeah. No vampires, just Will just there pirates. be vampires? Not in that one because it's already written. I'm saying in the future, will you write in vampires? Well, I don't know. There's four of us writing. You can talk, <laughs> talk to Jeff next week. Well, Amish vampires in space. Uh, we'll get some of those nice. in there. Little vampires in space. Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us this week. It's been a pleasure. Um, don't forget to ask the author. You can do that on AaronGansky.com or just on Facebook or Twitter informally. It doesn't really matter. And as always, you guys can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter and all the social media channels, which Molly handles for us, and or at least for me. And you can find us at altongansky.com, franklymydearmojo.com, heatherluby.com. Don't forget to go and check that out and read some of her short stories, which are fantastic, by the way. I, because Aaron is usually my editor. So I wasn't going to say that yes. out loud. But, um, <laughs> I, I usually say this is fantastic. Um, you may want to change one or two things, but she she's the talent there. So and I'm just actually excited. here's a plug for you. My piece getting ready to come out in Manslaughter Review was the last story you took to look took a look at for me. Oh great. Um, I'm I, I'm sure I'm, I know the last two. Um, this one the was title? the boys were watching. The boys were, oh, yes, the boys were watching. So I, there are three different ones that I remember from you. Yeah, the boys are watching. Oh, good for you. You, got, you found a home for it. That's a, that's a good one. That's definitely a good one. So, um, And people can find out about that at heatherluby.com, correct? That's right, yeah. Excellent. All right, and I'm, as always, at aarongansky.com. So thank you all for listening, and until next week, good writing. <laughs>